Okay, make your way back to your seats. Make your way back. I'm going to pray and dismiss our kids. You've defined the definable question today. Way to go. I'm proud of you all. What makes a good friend? Before we... Honesty? Okay. What else? Trustworthiness. I like that. Okay, calling your friends out. Wow, okay. They make you laugh. That's a critical thing. Humility. Humility. Listening skills. Listening skills. I like that. Yeah, I pray in this season for Live Free that we would develop deep friendships. I always say this, but we become a family that grows into a community. And I think that's our only hope in Kelowna, is that the gospel affects us at a family level and changes us and transforms us and reaches people around us, our family, our friends, our neighbors, coworkers. But let's pray and we'll dismiss the kids so they can go have fun uh, in the theater next door. So let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. Would you speak to us? Would you speak to the children next door? Would they remember truths that would never be shaken away, Lord, that 20, 30 years from now they'd remember these things that they're taught at Live Free Church in a theater um, in the Landmark Grand Ten. I thank you for your, your love and your grace and your truth. Would you remind us of all those things today in this place? Amen. Kids, you may go with Levi. Go for it. Have fun. I think they actually have candy in the bin also, which is super fun. No candy here. Sorry, guys. All right, so if you have your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 15, verse 40. We're kind of closing this out. Um, Mark's gospel. And um, we use a translation called the CSB and a Christian Standard Bible. Um, I think it's the most readable, accurate translation in the market. I love it. Um, it's accessible, but also holds to language. So if you have your Bibles, Mark 15, and we'll start there in verse 40. But C.S. Lewis, um, one of my favorite authors, someone recently said to me, Colby, you got to stop talking about C.S. Lewis so much, but I just love C.S. Lewis's work. He wrote a, uh, an address called The Inner Ring. I don't know if you, has anyone read The Inner Ring? Um, it's like a lecture he gave that turned into an article. Really remarkable. You should go read it. Um, but really, it's an insightful article. And really what he's talking about is the deepest desires of the human heart is to get inside the inner ring. To find the inner ring and to get inside of it. Someone on the internet made a really cool image. And really, what is your inner ring when you think about it? Right? So often we end up right here where it's like you're on the outside and you actually want to join this group and and join the inner ring. But actually, once you get into the inner ring, you actually make another inner ring. That's what C.S. Lewis's problem said, is, is that we're always moving to another ring, to another inner ring. Always. And it shows actually the human heart that you might, your inner ring might be going to the right schools. It might be knowing the right people. It might be the right job. It might be the right income. It might be the right marriage. It might be the right whatever it is for you. Just fill in the blank. But once you get into the inner ring, C.S. Lewis says, is that the best part for you and for me as we get into the inner ring is that you have other people come to you. That you have other people that want to center around you. That they actually orbit around you. Maybe it's morality. Maybe it's the right church. Maybe it's the right ideology or the right theology. That is the inner ring for you. But once you get on the inside and you create another inside, People have to orbit around you. That our life is constantly going from one ring to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to try to find our new inner ring because our hearts are not satisfied until they find satisfaction in Jesus. You see, what inner ring are you looking for? Even the people that Jesus encountered this passage today, marginalized people, religious people, irreligious people, they are actually looking for the inner ring. We look at a metaphor for the inner ring, it's kind of like you think about a solar system, right? When you look at a solar system, 
it exists as a system because all the planets agree that there's one center and the rest of them orbit around that center. There's only one inside, and that's why it's a system. But imagine if every single planet said, no, actually, I'm going to be the center of the universe. <laughs> what would it look like? If every single planet became stationary and used all its gravitational pull to get everything else to revolve around it, it said, no, actually, I want to be the center. I want you to orbit around me. I want you to revolve around me. What would happen? You wouldn't have a system. You'd have a disaster, a cataclysm. See, that's us today, isn't it? <laughs> we talked about a, a quote last week from Oprah Winfrey talking about your truth, but isn't that the world we live in today? When you talk about the fact that we want people to evolve around us or to, to orbit around our circle, the things that we would define that make our life significant and secure. And when you look at the problem of our world today, it's the fact that we've actually made our whole world cosmic car wrecks. That sometimes we're not actually orbiting around Jesus, we're orbiting around our career and our financial bank accounts and our esteem and our degrees, our houses. See, one of the greatest passions, C.S. Lewis says, is of the human heart is to be on the inside and have everyone else center around you, to really be the center of your own universe. So for you and I, what's your, what's your inner ring? What's the thing when you like close your eyes and you daydream about, man, if I just had this, if I just did this one thing, my life would be amazing. What is your inner ring? Is it health? Is it wealth? Is it power? prestige? What's the thing that you daydream about? What's the thing that when you are idled, your mind wanders towards? Because we all have that. C.S. Lewis in this article says, the quest for the inner ring will break your heart unless you break it. But if you break it, a surprising result will follow. If in your working hours you make the work your end, you will presently find yourself all unaware inside the only circle in your profession that really matters. You'll be the one of the sound craftsmen and the other sound craftsmen will know it. Do you hear what he's saying here? Is that when you've arrived as the electrician, you want everyone else to know that you are the better electrician. <laughs> we do this in church, we do this in life, we do this in our families. We say, when? My sister and my brother, they're disasters, but me? I got, pretty, I got it all together. <laughs> look at my life. Look at my house. Look at my bank account. Look at my everything. You see, I want to look today at how Jesus, in light of the cross, in light of human history, the most critical part, I think, of human history is his death and resurrection it's how it actually changes our centers. It changes the thing that we actually orbit around. And how realizing that Jesus is the true center of my life and your life actually changes you in deep ways you never thought possible. So, Mark chapter 15, verse 40, here's what it says. In your Bibles go there. It's on the screen. There were also women watching from a distance. Among them, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joses and Salome. In Galilee, these women followed him and took care of him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. When it was already evening, because of the day of preparation, that was the day before the Sabbath, a man named Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had already died. When he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph, and he, and he brought some linen cloth. Joseph took him down and wrapped him in the linen. When he laid in the tomb, 
cut out from the rock and rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph, was watching where he was laid. So let's look at three people that Jesus encounters in this passage. You have marginalized, you have religious, you have the irreligious. But let's look at the marginalized first, that you and I live in a world where we actually have kind of like equality, don't we? That that when you look at a passage here, where in verse 40, it says something very profound that maybe you and I might not even be aware to, might not even have our ears attuned to. That if you go to the end of all the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you get to the most important events of Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, something critical happens. His disciples, they're gone. They're not around. They're scared. They're despondent. They're totally gone. See, when it comes to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the only followers of Jesus who are really with him through all three of those things were who? Women. See, verse 40. It's only women we can see here it was watching when he died. See, women saw where he was buried in verse 47. You'll see also in Mark 16, verse 1, the women were the ones who actually saw him first resurrected in the tomb. It's like the men disappeared and the women dominate the last part of the Jesus narrative. And here's why it's so extremely interesting for us and interesting in this passage of Scripture. Because both in the Jewish and the Roman cultures, that you might not be aware of this, and of the law of the time, that a woman's testimony had no legal status. That their evidence could never be brought into the court. Their testimony had no legal status at all. There was this universal understanding across all the cultures of the ancient world that what they believed about women. Okay, I'm just going to clarify this right now. This is not what I believe. This is what the culture that they lived in believed was that women were inferior and they were unreliable. That is an offensive message to our culture today. But this is the most amazing thing that in Mark's gospel, all the gospels, that the most critical part in human history of salvation, that God trusts it not to his disciples, not to his inner core of disciples. He entrusts it to women. They're like the lifeline of the gospel. Nobody else knows what's going on, but only the women in this passage, in this scripture, see it. And only the women, and we'll see this next week, know what God's up to. In fact, you imagine for decades after Jesus' death, when they shared these accounts over and over and over and over and over again. When they said, you know why we saw Jesus' death? You know why it's true? Because these are the women that were there that were eyewitnesses. That's what happened again and again and again and again. The women see it. They witnessed it. They saw the death, the burial, the resurrection. See, God makes women his witness at a time in history where no other society would have trusted him in the same job. You see, when you look at, when you put Jesus at the center of your life, what does it do? It it brings up the marginalized. What does the death of Jesus do? It brings the marginalized into his orbit, even when you think that they're actually not qualified. It elevates their status. It pulls people in from the fringe. People who have been longing forever and ever and ever to get into an inner ring but can't. People who in this world say they can't help themselves. See, the gospel, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that saves sinful people like you and I, what does it do? It elevates people. People who are watching and waiting, like the women in Mark's gospel. It's the most amazing thing. This is a document that has women in here as the eyewitnesses. 
See, God takes a group of women and trusts them with something to do that no one else does. That God shares a secret of what he's doing in the world, shares the gospel with a group of women, brings them in, doesn't keep them on the outside, but brings them into the inner circle. And that's what we have here. We have a God who says, I'm for the justice of the marginalized. That's what we have. We have a God who also hates the lust for the inner ring. The thing that you and I make, our inner ring in our life, that there's a God who says, I hate it as much as your heart should hate it. He says, I'm going to change a human heart in the midst of them to change systems. I'm going to change the whole system so no longer do you orbit around trying to get into the inner ring, but you actually orbit around a thing called the cross, his death, and his resurrection. But then you look at these, these women who Jesus actually lifts up, but then the question is, how do we actually change Because Jesus can draw people in. He can draw marginalized people in. Like, you think about our culture today. When you go downtown Kelowna, there's homeless people all over. And Jesus is saying, actually, is I could draw them in. Change their social status. But look at a man. Joseph of Arimathea. In verse 43 in your Bibles, he's a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Here's what we learn about Joseph, okay? First of all, Joseph was prominent, which means he has power, he has prestige. Matthew's gospel says he's rich, which is kind of applied here anyways in this passage. We learn from God, John's gospel, which is really special, is that he was a friend with a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was also a member of the ruling council who was also incredibly wealthy, a Pharisee, a member of the party of religious leaders who were really Bible-believing, doctrinally orthodox, and really incredibly ethical. See, Nicodemus and Joseph show up, and they were Pharisees, and they went together and buried Jesus' body. That's what John tells us. And now here's what's interesting about that. You know, on one hand, you look at these religious men who encounter the death of Jesus. You have these women who encounter the death. You have these irreligious people who are encountering the death of Jesus, Pilate and the centurion. The centurion is just an idol worshiper. He's living the way he wants. He's trampling on the moral law. And so religiously and morally, he's an outsider. He's not in the inner ring. But Joseph and Nicodemus, they have made it in the inner ring morally, pharisaically, religiously. So you have all these people, people who are marginalized, people who are religious, irreligious, and what does Jesus do? He draws them all in. But he's changing two people's hearts in real profound ways here. Joseph in John's Gospel, Nicodemus. People who are men, who are aristocrats, wealthy, they're in the inner ring. They're in the inner ring of society that, in that, in that culture, people, they go, I just wish I was more like Joseph. But all these people, the marginalized, the religious, the irreligious, they're all responding to Jesus in the same way. So here's some change I want to show you about about Joseph and Nicodemus in this passage. What's happening? What's happening in their hearts? The first thing is they become bold. You see, they're getting courage they never had before in the Gospels. It says Joseph went to Pilate and boldly asked for the body of Jesus, and it makes sense because he never had the courage before this moment to ask for it. The Roman soldiers, the Romans just had had tried Jesus and found him guilty of high treason. The Jewish Sanhedrin just found Jesus guilty of blasphemy. And now Joseph, a Pharisee, and Nicodemus for the first time are willing to say something that they've been saying in secret for a long time. 
is that they boldly are following Jesus. They, they liked him in secret. They followed him probably deep down in their hearts, but they didn't want to actually act out on that. They were believing in him, but they didn't want anyone else to know. You see, here's where like a true revolution starts in Kelowna. I was talking to someone this past week about a, a revival, and maybe you know a little bit about revivals, but where does a revival start? It doesn't start in a room like this. It starts in a human heart. People who are cut their own brokenness and their own sin and saying, wow, God is so amazing. I want what I've experienced for other people. You see, Joseph and Nicodemus, they experienced God, they experienced Jesus in a very tangible way, but they've been having a revolution that's silent in their heart. That they've, it's been eating away slowly at them, permeating their, their whole soul. I've heard this story a few times. But when I came to plant a church in Kelowna, there's a guy I met who was an Anglican church planter. All right, that's just, you don't get Anglicans and Baptists in the same room usually, but we were there, and we were doing a simulation. But he shared his story with me. He said, you know what? When I went to university in Florida, I was a devout atheist, and I just want to tear Christians down. He said, you know what I did was I went actually into like the, the Christian meetings, like arena hosts, at UBCO, and he goes, I go in there, and I'm just debating, I'm just a devil's advocate, and I'm just like jeering them and jabbing them, and he's like, it was amazing. It was incredible. I just go in there and trash them. But he said, you know what, something happened? I started to doubt myself. I started to go home and go, I wonder about this Jesus. Who is he? Like, they seem like they really are committed even when I'm like jabbing them, sparring them, putting them down, it sounds like they actually really believe this Jesus. Maybe he's real. You know, this guy, John, had a revolution before he ever stepped and said, Jesus, you're my life. It was an internal revolution. Faith always starts that way. Faith always starts in private, but always goes public. Faith always starts in a safe spot, but always gets pushed to a place of risk. You see, this is where Joseph really grows, when it's dangerous, when he's willing to risk it all to bury Jesus, to come out and show that they actually sympathize not with the Pharisees, but with Jesus, the Messiah, the King. Not to the Roman establishment, not to the Jewish establishment, but to Jesus, and it's horribly risky. See, what happened? What happened to this man who was in the inner circle? His attitude towards their own power and his own status changed. See, power, money, and status tend to become not just something that you have, but something that you are, if you have it. It becomes an identity piece. That's how you feel good about yourself. That's how you wake up in the morning, saying, well, at least I'm not like that person. You ever been there? been there lots. That's how you feel good about yourself. You can say things like, I can wear these things, I can go to these restaurants, I can be with these people, I can live in this place, and this is who I really am. But here's what you have. You have a man who jeopardizes it all, his power, his money, his prestige, And that's what Joseph and Nicodemus are doing. They're using all their power as members of the Sanhedrin to go and get a body and to bury it. They're using their power to do the right thing and they're jeopardizing everything. They're men who forgot about their inner ring and are orbiting around the cross. They're not afraid of losing the status or money Their whole life is changing. They become more generous. They're giving away their power. And they're getting more bold. They become more and more bold. Do you know what it looks like for you to step out of your circle, become bold about the things that really matter in our life? The things about following Jesus. 
Maybe it looks like being more generous to a friend, to a church. Maybe it looks like serving kids' ministry. Maybe it means serving your neighbors, telling your coworkers. Maybe it means inviting people to church on a Sunday. I have no idea, but what it means is you become bold. But it also means you become humble. See, these men are not just becoming more strong, but they're becoming more weak. Look at verse 46. What did Joseph do? He actually bought some linen cloth. Joseph took him down, wrapped him in linen, put him in a tomb. We'll talk about this more a little bit next week, but in ancient times in Palestine, when a person died and was buried, what they did was they washed the body. They wrapped it in linen, anointed it with spices and perfumes. See, the sun was going down on the Sabbath, and you really can't do something like this. And they didn't finish the job. And you'll find next week that the women come and try to finish the job. You see, this is something that slaves did, that women did. But these men show up in their humbleness. They pull a a beaten, bloodied body off a cross. It was dirty. It was a dead body. You know, they don't embalm it. It'd been beaten. There was guts coming out of it. It was incredibly stomach-turning, loathsome, dirty, awful job. But who shows up to do it? Joseph. John's Gospel, Nicodemus. Not predominant men do this. You see, what does a changed heart look like? It looks like you have incredible boldness and you have incredible humbleness to go to places that you never thought you'd ever end up. Imagine if you asked Joseph in this moment when he's wrapping Jesus' body three years before that, if he expected to be wrapping a crucified man's body and place him in a tomb, there's no way. You see, humbleness puts you in places outside your inner ring, places of comfort and prestige. It takes you to spots where you never thought you'd be. See, that's what the, the gospel does. That's what Jesus does. It makes you bold and humble. But here's how you realize, I think, you're stepping out of your own circle to orbit around Jesus. Right? The gospel, which we always say a lot here, which is the fact that you and I are sinful, broken people in need of a Savior, and Jesus Christ lived and died, rose again to save us from sin, Satan, and death and truly make us free in him. The gospel isn't just making you happy and taking you to heaven when you die. That it actually makes you a person who becomes incredibly bold and incredibly humble, who shares power and privilege with other people around you, maybe people who are marginalized, people who are broken. See, the gospel says that you are so sinful, that I'm so sinful, that Jesus Christ died for us, and that makes you humble of any superiority you have in your life. You don't go to a community group and go, yeah, I'm just thankful I'm not like you. You know, it makes it, I'm actually one of us. See, the first thing when you orbit around Jesus, it makes you an agent of change in this world. That you are looking for where God can use you in this world to bring up the marginalized around you. Maybe even speaking for a coworker to a boss. Maybe it means being generous, providing a meal. But it means lifting people up around you, becoming agents of change in our world. The second thing is you see the Christian church is filled with people who are otherwise apart from the gospel, not the same. (laughs) Do you feel like that sometimes? Like we're not, we have one thing in common, Jesus. But you look at this mishmash group of people in this passage, women, religious leaders, affluent men, politicians, centurions, all these people, and they're coming and they're orbiting around Jesus. You see, the church is filled with people who are not 
like me or you. There's people who follow Christ, whose life orbits around Jesus. Your Christianity, the gospel, actually has, makes you have empathy for people, people who might be hurt, who might have a nuclear family but might not have a nuclear family. It might mean people whose kids are know Jesus but people whose kids don't know Jesus that we're deeply wanting to know Jesus. When I look around my community group all the time, what I have in common with these amazing, incredible human beings? Jesus. That's how you know you're orbiting around, not just your own little circle anymore. We're not just building like little spheres of, of cliques that people can say, yeah, in the church, I've arrived with my own little age category and now I'm good. Someone just, co- just asked me last week, you know, he's a, he's a pastor and he goes, so what's your young adult ministry like at your church? And I said, yeah, we just call people adults. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have that. I remember seeing someone's graduation for their master's degree. And this person walked across the stage, I'll never forget this moment, and was getting a PhD in some amazing cancer curing chemicals they're working on at UBC in Vancouver. When this person, this amazing young woman, got a degree at 24 years old, a PhD, nobody said, and this young adult is coming here to get a degree. You're just an adult. You see, what happens to us as Christians? It unites us in ways we thought not possible. One of my favorite commentators on this passage, D.A. Carson, puts in a very classic quote. He says here, what binds us Christians together is not common education or common race or common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. That Christians come together not because they form a natural collection because they've been saved by Jesus Christ. We are a band of natural enemies turned into friends who love Jesus for one another's sake. We are turned into friends who love one another for Jesus' sake. That's this church. This church is a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. And that's how you know Your life orbits around not just your own little inner circle, but around the cross. The last way I think we can we know that we're orbiting around not our circle but Jesus is you look at your identity and you look at the boldness and the humility you get. It's only really one way through your need for God's grace. It's your need for repentance. It's your need to have something that you can't do on your own. That when you go from inner circle to inner circle to inner circle to inner circle, that nothing can actually satisfy you like Jesus can satisfy you. There's nothing that can save you like Jesus can save you. That when all of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus, what does it start? In a moment of pain, but a moment of grace. A moment of saying, there's nothing left in my life but you, Jesus. I like this analogy of someone sent me of a seed. Right? How does a seed grow? It dies. Like, how do we pray that prayer as a church and say, let every seed of my life die? So Jesus, you may grow something in us that's unexpected in ways that's unexpected in full boldness, in full humbleness, not us trying to do it on our own, but you actually doing the work in ways I thought not possible, in pain, but in grace. I'm going to bring Levi back up here as we close this out. I pray that we be a church that in God's grace, in his humbleness, in his boldness on the cross, 
would affect us in ways not just on a Sunday morning, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. This whole year would affect us and say, wow, your cross, your resurrection changes in ways we never thought possible that this might be actually great news for the marginalized in Kelowna, the religious, like some of us, the Josephs in this room, the irreligious, the pilots, the centurions. But Jesus, would you do a work in us that we never thought possible? Would you change us in ways we never thought possible? But Jesus, you do the work. That your, your death on the cross reminds us of the places that we need to go in boldness and humility. It's a call for us today to go into Kelowna, to go into our communities in boldness and humbleness for the gospel. Let's pray. Jesus, would you show us where we need to be? Would you press upon us your death on a cross that changes everything about us? The way we think about our own sin, our own brokenness, our own pain, would you make us bold? because you were bold on the cross to take the sins of this world, to take the sins of us on yourself. In your humbleness, will we become humble to serve those around us? In your name, amen.